Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We're in episode number 29, and I have some friends uh, from across the pond uh, here to join for this episode. Um, I have some staff from Gosnell's Meadery, and I have Tom and Will. You guys, how you doing? I know that you guys are about uh, five hours ahead of me, so you're um, closer to yeah, the end of your day than me. Five, just after five o'clock, yeah, five so o'clock, yeah. we are... Almost done with the day. Yeah, it's been nice. It's been a good day. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Let's not do a roundup of what yeah. we've been up to today. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's been it's busy at the moment. So um, we are just going to come out of a lockdown in the UK, start of April, uh, like middle or middle of April. So we're looking forward to that, and we're, so we're getting our tap room all ready for um, uh, the public to come back into, and generally the trade and customers and everything life starting to return to somewhere approaching normal is the idea yeah yeah that's like nice it. yeah so can you tell us um about gosnells like what what what's your um what's your story sure so i'm tom i'm tom gosnell i founded the business in 2014 i always forget but it's been, it's been a little while now um and we make mead and we're the first meter in london for about 500 years from what i could see oh, wow. uh, and we obviously make mead out of honey um we kind of specialize in lighter hydromels so most of our range is kind of either four percent or five and a half percent um kind of playing around at that level and yeah it, we've been going for about seven years and kind of what else does it say well i've got kind of run out of steam uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been going for seven years we're the only ones sort of here doing that hydromel style we do we do do a variation now we do a little bit of barrel work and we, yeah. we play around with some traditionals noticing that we don't really have too many other sort of mead uh meaderies around the uk we're kind of having to fill in a lot of slots plus it's not as uh, well established as the states as well so we find ourselves you know, being able to do everything and not having to stick to a niche. Yeah, I think the the what the the meads that have had the most commercial success, though, in terms of like the ones we sell the most of, is definitely the lighter meads in the cans. So we're in, you know, um, we've got four cans in our core range that we sell, you know, around the world, including the US. So you can get it, mm-hmm. get it in Total Wine, which is always exciting, um, and uh, in the UK, uh, and that's kind of the bread and butter. And then we do some more interesting stuff on. Yeah, top. and then we work a lot more with honey and getting a little bit closer to that terroir sort of aspect of it. And we do uh, ranges of like uh, monofloras against uh, sort of single origin or single beekeeper sort of stuff as well, and just try to show people that that honey is a a really cool medium to play. In. You know, it's mm-hmm. quite easy just to just to think of it as you know supermarket honey, and you know you put yeast over the top, you get different characters or different ABVs. But actually playing with different honey can you know create a pretty cool story. Yeah, well, and I want to. I have some questions because um, I have attempted to make some light meats. I've never made a four percenter, so I want to dive into that in a little bit and ask you about how you um, how do you achieve a. Uh, granted, I've not tried your stuff. It is a total wine, but the closest total wine to me is I think like 500 miles away. So I, I have not been able to get it yet. My plan is to, but I do have questions about low ABV stuff. Um, so talking about you guys, like you just said, you're, you're more low ABV, ABV side. Um, what's your flagship product? What would you say you guys is your crown jewel so far? Obviously, so I think the, the original recipe, which I started back in 2014, was what we call the Gosnells of London. It comes in a 75, a big wine bottle serve. It's five and a half percent, made with 100 percent orange blossom honey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's definitely the mead that's had the most refinement, right? So the recipe's been around for the longest, and we've definitely polished that. And it it's, it feels like it's it's a finished recipe, I guess. Yeah, that's one of one of the hardest things to do is to master a recipe. I don't think it ever really happens, but we kind of put it on the shelf now and go, I don't think without a change, a big change in equipment, we would ever touch it again. It's, um, it's kind of also the basis for the rest of the, uh, the products as well with the, with the recipe developed for that. It was so honey forward. And so, you know, such a big mouth feel for a hydromel, which, you know, if you played around hydromels, that is so difficult to achieve. Mm-hmm. And it, it's just, uh, yeah, we, we sort of finished it off. I think, maybe a year or two ago. Yeah, it's a bit lots of work done. Yeah. And we moved from um, bottle conditioning to, to forced carbonation and, you know, little tweaks like that towards the end. And we just, yeah, we kind of nailed everything we wanted from that. But yeah, the next flagship is the, is the four cans though, I suppose, after that. Yeah, and I think we definitely sell more of the four cans just because they're smaller products, right? Mm-hmm. And they kind of a little, go, bit a little bit more approachable, yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, 
And like you just said, it's almost impossible to master a recipe. Like you said, you guys have uh, arrived at a point where you feel like it is, it is excellent. If not, let's say close to perfect. Um, do you still feel like from batch to batch, you make minor changes or do you guys feel like you have that one down so much to a science that you're like, it, well, pretty much, I know that's like a, I hope we didn't make minor changes because that would just yeah. be yeah. So sorry, yeah. from a commercial point of view, that would just be us getting it wrong. So yeah, hope, right, hope right. It's kind of is a conscious decision, and there was definitely yeah, so, kind of a conscious process of tidying things up. Um, yeah, with that there is kind of you know like any recipe development is grab grab one aspect and 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 change it or have one idea and and start to figure out how to get to it. But as it goes to variation, because we use honey as well, there's no real like there is a huge amount of consistency with the honey that yeah. we use and we use a blend, but even still then like I'll notice it a little bit batch to batch that, you know, that honey does sort of shift a little bit. Yeah. And even just to have, how the yeast grows, you remember it's an organic mm -hmm. entity, right? So again, it grows in a different way. And that I guess is one of the exciting things about brewing is it's not, it's not all science. There is a bit of reacting to, to what's going on in the tanks as it develops. But there, there is uh, like uh, points that we hit, right? There is some oh, yeah. characteristics within, within the recipe where you're like, okay, I need to hit this. I need to hit that. And there's, there's very fundamental points that we've found out over the time that really influence the style that we love about that 5.5. So I guess my question is with minor changes, not that you're going to um, adapt your recipe a lot, but let's say that you, come out of the primary and you're noticing that the uh, tannic value that you normally get at that point is not as consistent or strong. Are you guys going to do something to, in order to reach back to where you want it to be, to get to that final result? Are you going to add more tannin? Are you going to make small adjustments in that regard? I think what's interesting about our method, and we'll maybe get onto it with uh, the hydromels in general, is that we are not doing a primary and a secondary. So mm -hmm. we are, during the primary fermentation, we'll stop the fermentation short by pasteurizing it. So basically when it gets to about, normally about two thirds is roughly where it ends up, you'll, you'll then stop the fermentation by pasteurization. So there is a, there is a... Because um, technically there is a secondary, but it's not a usual secondary, right? Because we do sit in a conditioning tank and carbonate, right? Yeah, okay. So the, the, without, without that there, we need to be able to drop the yeast out of suspension, which you do through filtration, but there's also carbonation tank, but it's not your typical... It's not your typical primary secondary. So I guess the answer to answer your question, there's occasionally, it's about picking that point, about when mm -hmm. on yeah. the fermentation curve you're gonna, gonna pasteurize it and stop it. and yeah there is there is and i guess we would maybe bring that we've got we've got the ability to blend now between blood batches which yeah, is which is the, really which is really helping so you know if one if we were to make a mistake say and let it go too far or too dry the next batch we could then back off and make a bit sweeter and then balance those out when we blend and condition but we yeah we have pretty pretty uh rock solid benchmarks as well so you know we don't really have too much trouble with let's say creating too much of a high acid profile and we kind of get that quite early when that acid hits terminal you know mm -hmm. we kind of know like, oh you know we can see curve against curve and go okay that, that that acid profile is exactly where it should be after three days or that 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 gravity point like that sg is where it should be after three days and we can kind of control it and we know the the way to control it too so you know let's say we produce too much acid early on for some reason let's say we dropped a you know the cooling system didn't work or someone didn't set the you know the cooler at the right mark which, you know, it happens, <laughs> happens you know, yeah. human error always works so you, you'll start to notice that and then you can you know use your your basic sort of uh, control measures of temperature or you know whatever else you're sort of using to control that that uh, that process you can then start to adjust from there you know if you got too much acid up forward drop your temperature down and that acid profile will just start to to uh you know even itself out or if you produce too many high alcohols at the start, you know, same sort mm -hmm. of time or, you know, it's, it's, you know, extending your fermentation lengths as well, which is something that, you know, you don't really get when you're doing quite big meads where you're sort of left up to, so the, the, the mead to decide how long it's going to take to, you know, to get to the bottom of that sort of fermentation. We can extend it by slowing down the, the fermentation, lower temperature over a longer time, and we get a few more characteristics come out. So when you compare it against those be benchmarks, you kind of, You've got a lot of options to kind of fix it. So I don't think we've ever really lost a batch. Touch wood. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so you're talking about acid adjustments. What are your, I'm sure you've experimented with multiple ways to do it. How do you generally make those adjustments? Are you 
are you specifically put in citric acid in or malic acid or are you using lemon juice lime juice what's your uh pre or post ferment you're talking about there uh either way are you are you putting it up front or are you guys doing it post so with, with hydromels the way that we do it we we don't do any real regulation afterwards talking about hitting those benchmarks and getting yeah. that fermentation running right um we try to load front load you know we're, we're fermentation is mm -hmm. running fast we turn around a four percent hydromel in seven days you know like we we have to front load to be able to have that control we can't do stage feeding there's no point there's no need um you know there's not that much stress on the yeast but pushing up further then we'll do some you know we might do some adjusting on the back end if we're you know back sweetening or, or pasteurizing in that way same as you do for you know just balancing any sort of flavor profile out and yeah, more of the type stuff, a bit yeah. stronger ABVs, or with generally with ingredients that we haven't used before, right? And we're not entirely sure how they're gonna um, gonna go with the base mood. Um, so yeah, there's a bit of regulation at the end. But yeah, we, we we front load, and uh, we even front load when we do um, higher ABVs as well. Okay, so above that sort of thirteen percent, we won't really stage feed or stage no. nutrient feed. Well, and I ask that. Um, and, and, you know, I, nutrients are different for me, but I, I use nutrients. That's not to say that. What I'm saying is that um, the adjustments being acid and tannic adjustments and that stuff, I guess I spend more time doing in post because I haven't, you guys have, have mastered, mastered a recipe and you know when to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm, I feel like I'm not at that point with a lot of my stuff. So I'd rather have the control at the end to go, yeah, I need just a little bit of lemon juice just to give it that pop or something. So yeah. I think for home brewers, that's a big thing. And um, I, I didn't make any adjustments to my stuff for a long time. Cause I was scared to, I was like, what happens if I mess it up? And maybe it's just cause I make so much stuff now, but I'm willing to throw stuff in. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I chalk it up as a learning experience for that thing. So I, I think that's interesting. I was curious about that only because commercial size, um, I'm sure you guys are obviously you have money on the line. So you're, you're going to be very uh, strict in your method and your procedure with everything. Yeah, that, that hopefully. Yeah, no, no, I know we are right, and I think, but that also comes down to Will's point about we've been ma we've making the same recipe and four variations of it for what seven years. So we've done mm -hmm. I don't know how many batches we've done, um, many batches. Four hundred, five hundred, and something. Yeah, of those okay. Batches. Yeah, so oh man, um, so you've done it so many times. You've also got a, a vast bank of data to go back on to kind of say. Oh, these are the fermentation curves. This is what it does. You know, this there's even notes from. You yeah, know, I've only been with the company now. What, three. I want to. It's 2021. 2021. Yeah, three years. <laughs> yeah, wow. Oh god, that went quick. Um, yeah, I've even got like notes from from previous head brewers seven years ago about you know, well not seven years ago, five yeah, years ago. That would ago. have been me. That would have been you. And I didn't keep it. Yeah, <laughs> just notes on those recipes and those changes and and you know talking about we've been using the same yeast strain in the house now for about five years yeah we, we changed that up yeah about yeah. five years ago so when that sort of started happening there was, there was a real good amount of record keeping during that period where i can jump back to and go like oh cool i can see you know i make my own sort of guesses as well but it's nice to go back and sort of compare that but um yeah God. well, well I, I um i have some questions about the commercial side and we'll get there and i, I really want to ask you guys about starting a metery and, and for my audience who uh, some people might be interested in doing that. I'm sure there are some some questions they have as well. But one last little thing about you guys and your meadery. Um, what are some of your favorite honeys to use? I know you said Orange Blossom it, for your, your flagship. What are some other ones you like? Uh, so I like Borage. Do you know Borage honey? So Borage, Borage is a... English star flower is another uh, name for it. It's this blue kind of herb that grows in the UK. Interesting. And uh, it gives it this kind of spicy, little bit peppery, kind of yeah, light vanilla, vanilla um, winter spice sort of thing. Quite probably. light though. Yeah, um, it's like um, rapeseed, but on steroids. It's like a rapeseed yeah. base where it's got this creamy sort of texture, and then it's got vanillins and spices behind it. I really like it. I think it's really pretty. It's also like blue in terms of the, the color. Yeah, it's the like color. It's got really spicy. Yeah. Like it's not blue, obviously. <laughs> right. But it's got this kind of uh, yeah hue to it. Uh, and I, that's one of my favorites. I find it really interesting. 
also because it's uh, what we like to do is give people a spoonful of the honey that the meads are made from and kind mm. of ram home that link between the terroir of the land and the final product. So for us, that for me especially, the orange blossom and the borage both encapsulate that. Mm. If you taste a spoonful of the honey, you completely understand where the meads come from. Um, and mm-hmm. It's a really compelling way to kind of explain what we're doing and what we're all about here. Yeah, that's really cool. I didn't realize you guys did that. Um, that's that's fascinating. I, I kind of like that. A lot of fun when we had yeah. a bar. That was kind of the the experience having a meat only bar in a, in a you know in a city with the only meadery. It's kind of we we had to dive into it, and that was one of the ideas. Yeah, that it was, it was and, a was a pairing of four. You did you did a flight of four meads with four jars of honey that were that went into the meads. And, that's, we still have a bit of that now. Yeah. We do our tasting bundles and things like that. Where we do sort of like live Zoom calls with people and, and sit down. And we send the honey and and show that connection. But um, for me personally, I think I've worked with the honey from Pitchbury Park, which is the one I always talk about. Which is sometimes you just get a honey that you're just never going to get again. Um, and I kind of like those honeys the most, where it's just like, I want to do a very basic recipe with it and just let that honey go. And I got this honey from Finsbury Park. Which is a park in North London. Yeah, right. it's like yeah. urban honey. And it just smelled like semi-dried tomatoes and dried mangoes. Hugely like acidic as well. So it smelled like uh, like acetic. So it smelled like a little bit like vinegar as well. And I made this mead out of it. And oh, it was delicious. It was, it was just, yeah, I'll never be able to recreate it again. No, and that's one of the cool things about working with those single origin honeys or the single beekeeper honeys you just get this this complete encapsulation of that season and the pl- sense of place and time and place a bit like wine making right and that that mm-hmm. for me is what's really exciting um i guess on the honey front the other one is the um the heather honey with all yeah, that protein cool, in yeah. so um we made this heather honey which i it just got so much protein in it, it just looked like there was this layer of kind of protein floating in the bottle which is hard so to it doesn't sound does that like make it hard to clear then if it has uh, yeah, yeah. Impossible. No, it, it's impossible <laughs> <laughs> so. unless you want to rack off the top and you kind of lose the essence as well so it wasn't necessarily one of those ones where you're like you know it needs to be bright clear and and you know you don't want to have any but like, there was no yeast sediment as such well they're probably a little bit because of the bottle condition but it was left in the bottle so you, know, you could roll the bottle before you drank it and it tasted incredible super round and thick and you know it stuck to your teeth and or you could rack from the top but when you rack from the top it was nice and clean you, you kind of got a little hint of it but it didn't mm-hmm. you know punch you in the face so sometimes leaving a bit of that sort of protein haze in the bottle kind of just gave it a little bit of a yeah and i think in general we don't bother with clearing too much like we're not too we're bottle conditioning, super bottle conditioning. Yeah. i mean some of the obviously the barrel age stuff is is clear but we're not i mean i'm certainly not obsessed with clarity uh, as a, as some members of the mead making community are mm. just just for me it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, it comes not with that. The, the craft beer change yeah. of mindset there moving from that sort of yeast and suspension and because we make hydromels we kind of have that, that mindset even when we push them up to eight nine percent but we, we like to condition in bottle, you know, yeah. it, it allows us to, to, you know, do some really cool stuff quickly and easily as well. You know, like if you're trying to force carbonate everything and you start to run out of, out of room and, and, and it's, it's time consuming and it's not the natural way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, leaving a little bit of sediment in the bottom that you pour off the top, you know, is uh, different. Yeah. So with the, I can't remember what kind of honey you said, but with there being so much protein and it really not clearing and, and talking about leaving the unclear stuff, do you have to forewarn people who purchase that and say, this is intentionally going to have this? Yeah, with, especially with the head of honey, because it yeah. wasn't just a, a little layer of sediment. It was like two inches, right? And it was like, it was probably cow. It was yeah. like, it was, um, yeah, it looked, I, I wish it, we had a bottle close to Yeah, I've got bottle. one up there. I'll come yeah, we'll second, it. When you look at it, it looks like mountains in a, in a snow globe, you know, like it's just, it's this beautiful looking um, landscape that it comes from. But yeah, we had to send that. Every bottle comes with a, a letter. And it came with a bottle of the, I mean, a jar of the honey as well, whenever you bought the bottle, so that you could really see those two together. Cause it, it was such a, when we were making it as well, like it poured like, um, like to, not like toffee, like, um, not, like fudge. Fudge, fudge. It was so oh, hard, even though I got it so warm that like you could hardly hold the bucket, it still wouldn't move. It just stuck together that much. Cause it's, it's yeah. the type of honey here that, that beekeepers hate. It's the hardest to get out of the hive. It just sticks inside, but uh, it makes a pretty cool meat. Yeah. 
Just want to cut it in here real fast and say, if you're enjoying the podcast and want to support the channel, feel free to check out manmademead.com. It's the one-stop shop to find recipes, brewing information, all of the YouTube series, and Amazon affiliate links that support the channel. You can simply click on the links, and when you purchase through that link, it actually, a, a part of the profit goes back to the channel and helps me continue to create content for you all. So I hope you will join me there. And thanks for listening. Back to the show. So with um, buying commercial bulk honey, I I just don't know the answer to this. Is most of it liquid or do you get a lot of stuff that's crystallized and you have to put it in your warmer? So generally the stuff we get from our our main distributor is mostly liquid because they heat it up to what? 30, 40 degrees in dandelions. I can't remember what temperature they get it to. Get it to about hive temperature so it flows and so they can move Uh it around the factory and then it it just comes to us. Um, It will crystallize. But it will eventually crystallize. Yeah, Yeah. if we leave it sit for long enough, then it should uh, should crystallize. Um, And then the stuff we get from beekeepers is varying uh, and varying attractions as well. So varying bits of wax and hive in the honey as well. Have you experimented at all with um, honeycomb or anything in a brew before? Using not, actual... Not intentionally. So our vintage is probably the closest that we get to that, where we get a really raw London honey and we kind of leave it. Yeah. Um, and that's that, that idea of sort of grabbing hives from the same same place every year and, and brewing the same way and just mm-hmm. sort of showing how okay, that sort of changes year on year. Um, and we kind of like to leave that extractant as as basic as possible, and we get you know properlies inside uh, you know everything, which yeah. is you know bits and pieces of everything from the hive. Which that's uh, well, I, I say that because I one time I found a jar of honey that had the honeycomb in it, and I was immediately as a YouTuber who does A/B tests and stuff, I was like, well, what would happen if you put the honeycomb in? Does it ferment differently? Whatever. So I found myself. Um, trying to figure out if uh, that was possible. I don't know if it would change anything. We're uh, making an escape over here. <laughs> uh, I got my, my dog at my feet and the dog and the cat don't get along. So it's a, it's a, we're gonna, there's gonna be a fight here in a second when he hops down. Um, so I wanna talk to you guys about nutrients. Now, I use lots of different kinds of nutrients. I uh, have floated around different ones from DAP to Fermate O to Fermate K to uh, just pretty much everything I can find. And I am floating towards or using Fermate O and K most now. What do you guys use as a commercial meadery, um, knowing that they're expensive? Like what's your go-to yeast nutrient? So it kind of it kind of depends, right? So depending on your water, depending on what you've got in there, is what you need. Like we 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 have quite hard water, so yeah. you know we we don't need a lot of um, a lot of meta- we've got quite a lot of magnesium in the water in London, mm. um, and that's that's magnesium and zinc. You know, it's a lifeblood for everything, but it's it's so pinnacle to yeast health. Um, we me personally, I'm a DAP person. Sorry. I, I kind of prefer the nitrogen rich sort of environment, probably over pitching with that. Sorry, trying to prevent a fight from <laughs> it's, um, it kind of it comes down we, we do a lot of hydromel, so we don't need to spend the money on quite complicated nutrient mixes. No, and also because of the method we use, we catch it before the yeast gets too stressed, right? So yeah. before the end of that fermentation, which is where I hypothesize where the nutrients like come into play yeah it starts to tail off um we've we've already stopped the fermentation before then so So, uh what yeast are you using then if you're stopping generally at four to five percent what yeast do you guys use most so we we run a lager yeast that we've been running here for about five years so Hmm. it's, it's developed since then but uh yeah it's a lager yeast and we use it in a in an interesting way that's well i've never used a lager yeast but i do think it'd be um fun to try. I have a series called the Yeast Shootout Series where I do same mead recipe, two different yeasts, let them ferment, and then I just taste them and say which one was better, essentially. Honest thing of making mead, right? Yeah. Like. Oh, yeah. That's I, that's been my favorite thing about the YouTube channel is um, all the science behind it. The recipes are cool. That's fun, but it's also fun to see what happens if you throw a banana in. Does it change this? Is it, so that's, that's kind of... Um, 
my experimentation but I, I feel like i have a lot of freedom to do that with the youtube channel so i know that you guys can't experiment as much on that note though when you are recipe testing um do you guys uh end up doing a lot of personal recipe testing or do you do stuff through gosnells and then you know what i mean are you doing stuff at, at home or on site I don't really do. I don't really do any recipe testing anymore. Yeah, so, so from, <laughs> like, we kind of use any any experience with uh, you know with our brewers to to do as much testing as possible, right? Yeah. That's that's just rule one hundred and one. The more stuff you play with, the better you're going to become. Um, we of course you know have time constraints, right? So you know when we get we got a, we got a release date, you know we can do a few iterations, and you get better at knowing how ingredients work, and you don't need to do you know, 30 experiments to pick. By the time you get to, you're like, okay, I'm going to pick three or four, and then I run through that and I go, okay, which one of those sort of worked? And sometimes you'll miss on those four. But very rarely, you kind of get an idea of where you want to go and you kind of know how to get there. Um, but we do try to do as many recipes as possible. Yeah, I think we've got a decent culture of playing with, pl like playing, like well, playing with recipes. Yeah. shelf behind us, which yeah. is kind of like you behind you now. There's probably four five six demijohns on at the moment a couple of big um 23 liters so i said five whatever, 23 liter demijohns yeah <laughs> i can't do the conversion backwards um, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah we, we we try different things we also pull a lot of stuff off the main ferments we do and and just play with it you know when you when you've got a thousand liters on to pull a, a five liter demijohn off and just go yeah, you know, and what happens if we run that dry what yeah. happens if we add you know this now instead of when we're going to post ferment um, you know, like what happens if, you know, like you said, you throw a banana in this, you know, like we've got the ability to, you know, five liters here and there is, is quite easily missed and, and, and gives us, uh, you know, I'm looking at Tom because uh, well, no, no, it we is. don't really talk about that. But, well, no, yeah. but like, we, like the other day and I was like, oh, what happens if that goes dry? Like, how do we, if we dry out our hydromels completely, as opposed to leaving them with some residual sweetness? And I actually thought it tasted all right. Actually, it was yeah. really good for the summer, like really dry, really easy. What we described as eminently smashable in the UK. Just like the sort of stuff you just toss down. So And I actually came up with quite a lot more body than, yeah, than we're all yeah. expecting. And it was one of those mm -hmm. nice things. I think we tasted it on our, uh, our podcast a couple of weeks ago. We were surprised about how clean it came out. And we're like, we know our stuff's really good, but very rarely do we run it past the, the FG. And um, yeah, it, it, it still had everything in it that we kind of wanted. Yeah. That's, so do you guys do any, within your experimentation, do any barrel aging of any sort or are you? Yeah, I mean, I guess we've only got, what, three barrels? Three barrels, Four, at, three the barrels at the moment. So we, when we say experimentation, we we do sell everything that comes out of there, basically. So we, we're kind of turning over those barrels and making them work reasonably hard. Yeah. So we, we do, um, we will put the things in there that we know that works. Right, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we'll run a bit of a short fermentation through the barrels. We've got a, a, one of the bigger barrels which we've had for years now, so it's lost all kind of oak character to impart. Like there's not nothing much more to give, but it does give this beautiful kind of surface for the oxidation of the mead. Mm. So um, the kind of uh, we use it in a slightly different way now, um, and also because we don't have enough fermentation vessels. But yeah, and it's also cool to go from from batch to batch in that there. So we we did a boucher um, in it not long ago, and uh, before that there, I lent it out to uh, a local local sake producer here in here in London, mm -hmm. and they did a plum sake in there. And then I just was as soon as because he asked me, he's like, "Oh, do you mind if I do a plum sake?" I was like, "Yes, go ahead, go nuts." So I rinse it out and you give it back to me. Just let me you know let me hit it. So I hit it with a little bit of warm water, cleaned the yeast out, and then just brewed a, a, a boucher straight over the top and you can get that nice plum character that almost pruny character that comes through <laughs> on the on the boucher and and that's kind of what's great about that barrel is that from batch to batch you know like we do a traditional in it but before that we did a boucher so now I've got a little bit of that caramel character come through mm -hmm. and you know we've got two bourbon barrels and we run two traditionals to get rid of the bourbon you know to just to dial that down and we slowly move through that process of yeah. a little bit of bourbon less bourbon a little bit more oak character and then we move into that micro oxidization okay interesting well and um i feel like if i had a metery of course you have to have the stuff you can make your money from and but i, I would have a hard time getting away from the experimentation <laughs> Which, which one's the money maker? Yeah. So, sorry, we'll get on to that in a second. That's well, I, you, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, 
<laughs> so um, here's here's a question for you. You guys have been in the mead community since 2014, and before then, uh, I don't know how active you were, um, or if you started making mead in 2014. How have you seen the community itself change from the moment you started to now? So I think I started making mead well, 2008, 2009, and. I kind of read everything there was on the internet that I could find and kind of just got cracking on my own. And I think I came to the conclusion about 2009 that nobody knew what they were talking about really. There was so many, so much um, misconceptions and everyone was mm -hmm. contradicting each other. So I kind of um, bought a couple of books and then just went on my own. Um, and then for me, it was more of a solo hobby. It was less of a, a community thing, I'll be honest, rather than you know, interacting with other people. It was something that I was doing as a hobby for myself um, and then set up the business in sort of 2014. And I think mead in the UK was just non-existent. Like like when, when I set it up, it was, yeah, it was, there was just nobody and nobody even knew what I was talking about really. At least now we've got to the point where most people at least understand that mead is an alcoholic drink. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that we're not selling meat. Well, that's, that's the normal one. Like, I'm not a butcher. You spell me. That's funny. Um, so, so I think, you know, there's a much, there's much more of a community. And I think particularly in the UK where obviously we're based, there are a lot more mead makers and there's a lot more going on. It's still small. It's still pretty, pretty tiny, but there are more and more people emailing us saying, how do I set up a meadery? Which is always yeah. a good always a good sign yeah and and like i started making meat in in 2017 when you joined us right yeah, yeah. and like i came from making wine and and beer and and playing around with things you know ever since i was a kid and i think that uh you know the meat industry kind of reminds me a little bit of you know when i fell in love with craft beer at the early stages of craft beer there is a really strong i just want to learn um characteristic in the meat community which is you know really uh really engaging when you see people who who aren't there to throw their egos around like you get sometimes in the beer community yeah. people are just like what are you doing what are you making you know how are you getting there like what have you found and i really just love that enthusiasm for learning and uh yeah you're right because i think certainly craft beer is in the uk has got very well, that's not uh, very yeah, that's it's, it, it's yeah. got, got, got a little bit cliquey and a little bit cool if that makes sense so there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of hype chasing and, yeah and people want to be people want to be cool and you know that 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 hype brewery that's not not what mead is at the moment <laughs> like let's be honest and it's just really cool to interact with other people like, we were talking to ricky from Gronfell last mm -hmm. week and it, like just we i mean we had a beer with him on friday uh virtually and uh it was awesome. It was just really cool yeah, just so to hang out and just be like, hey, this is stories yeah, and, yeah, and just be know. like, oh, do you remember that time? Yeah. <laughs> Have a little bit of a cry. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, yeah. Oh, go ahead, good. No, I was just saying that it's just, it's, it's nice that it's still that way. And even though that it's growing, I don't really see that come into, into fruition yet. You know, there's not the- No, we're quite a long way. In, I, I don't know anybody who's put their hand up and said, I'm the meat expert. Mm-hmm. Well, and Tom, you mentioned when you started that everybody, I mean, everybody's throwing information around, like, yeah. like it's biblical fact for mead. So oh, what yeah. are some, what Brewers are some things are about that as well? Yeah. Like even beer brewers are awful yeah. at just yeah. taking a piece of information and that's fast. That's gospel. that's gospel with no backing up, no science. So, um, yeah, sorry. What are, oh, I was going to say, what are some things that you maybe still to this day here that, uh, um, you're like, I, I don't believe that. You know what I mean? What are some of those uh, myths, mead myths, as I would call them? You need to age mead for a year. That was the big one that I came mm -hmm. up with when I was um, when I was starting. Oh, everything I read at that time was, I, uh, you know, you need to age it for six months minimum before it tastes good. And you're like, yeah, there's a bit of truth in that. Like, like most things that if you turn out a 13 percent mead at home with no temperature control and stress the yeast you probably will need to age it for six months. Mm -hmm. But there, there are other ways to do it as well. Um, that's probably the biggest one. How about you, Will? I'm struggling to think. Many such don't really listen to anyone else. It's well, my yeah, stubborn. A, a lot of the misconceptions usually come around from the homebrew side, right? Yeah. And, that, that's, and I've seen a lot of them sort of be done on your channel as well, you know, like, you know, raisins as nutrients. I, you know, coming from, you know, making stuff in my life, I'm like, no. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's, you know, there's, there's tannins in that. There's, there's a little bit. There's, you know, there is some micronutrients, but not enough that you're, you know, you have to add a lot of raisins to to do mm -hmm. it. And then, not, yeah, it's it. You know. 
yeah it's like a great must right it's the same thing you know you don't really necessarily need to add anything to it you know because it's it's 100 percent fruit but if you're adding a whole lot of sugar to your great must you're, you're oh, the other one it. is like soul fighting at the beginning yeah everyone so, everyone to seems to soul fight, fight at the beginning and all the homebrew recipes or that you you have oh to really stabilize. yeah Huh. So a lot of the a lot of the homebrew recipes when I started, you saw you sulfite it at the beginning, left it sorry, left it for uh, whatever long it was, twelve or twenty four hours, and then um, got to work on it. Which I don't know. I, I guess maybe. But yeah, that seems sketchy to me. I don't know. I yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't know. know. I've never tried it, but it seems like no, it's just conflicting. Well, so, you know, like instead of like you would with with beer, where you run it through the boil and and. You know, that sort of kills everything off. Everyone's got that idea that before they start, they need to really kill everything that's yeah. in the must. And you're like, well, if you pitch high enough and your pitching rates are good, you've got an organism that is pretty resilient. Yeah, the idea is it outcompetes everything else. You're making an, uh, an environment for that one specific yeast. Yeah, and if yeah. you raise your alcohol high enough and yeah. drop your pH during that process, then that bacteria is never going to kick off again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's. Um I find those interesting and obviously, you know, Will said it, I, I attack a lot of those myths on my channel just because they're fun for me. But also, I do want to kind of get rid of misconception or confirm things because yeah. some things are true. I'm not saying, I never, uh, I'm never attacking things that I believe are false all the time. I want to confirm things too. So, like the raisins as nutrients was the big one for me that I had heard in the beginning. That every single recipe had a handful of raisins in it and... Um, and that was it. it didn't talk about yeast nutrient but it said throw some raisins in so stuff like that was interesting when i first started and i, I continually to this day will still try and find those weird myths and beliefs that people have and and see what i can do with them because i think it's it's important for us to learn about them and their validity or if they're invalid yeah have you done one on boiling honey or like i had not or full like boil I've heated honey. I, I did it um, a I did low heat pasteurization yeah. um, on one, and then I I did a, sim a similar test, but I haven't done true boil other than I mean only to about 140 Fahrenheit, which is low pasteurization point for me for 20 minutes, and then I mix the honey in. Same thing for the other one, and I, I honestly didn't notice a big taste difference between them. Now it was it wasn't very hot. And I I've not I've I mean, you know we try and we're using a really um really good quality natural honey with loads of bits in. We will try and to minimise the heat treatment of it to try and preserve mm -hmm. that. But it'd just be interested to see. Well, maybe we'll have to have a look. Yeah, I, I, we've done some things with it about um, using because we sometimes use a blend of honey uh, through certain recipes. So we kind of tried putting in different honeys at different temperatures. And, you know, if you put a more delicate honey at a hotter temperature and then add a, you know, a more robust honey, like a more sort of body rich honey at a, at a lower temperature in the same boil, you're going to get a different profile. You're going to lose a little bit of those nuances because you, when you, when you heat, you know, when steam comes out of something, you're taking other particles with it and other compounds with it as well, you know? So, you know, how much that affects is, is probably a little bit of perception more than reality, but. You know, for us, that's what we sort of found. So we always add the, the body honey first and the more delicate honey second when we're doing blending. Well, that's because yeah. we drop the temperature. Because yeah. we bring so much honey into the boil, they're dropping the temperature way down by the time you've got it done. Mm -hmm. I do think that there would be a, a chance if I had heated it for longer um, that it would change it. But I was also worried about getting too close to the boche side. You know, if I, if I heat for too long, then I'm caramelizing certain sugars and that's not an equal product anymore. You know, it's you have a something that has a different profile so i didn't push it super far on my test but i would be curious to uh push the line a little bit and see if there is a difference because i know a lot of old recipes this is another test i'll do will actually um heat their must and do a similar thing and i haven't done that I, i'd be curious to see the difference between heating the must and not yeah that's kind mm -hmm. of that's, yeah mm -hmm. that's what i was thinking so i don't know that's that is a a, a test for another day. You're giving me get new YouTube content to make, <laughs> which is which is awesome. Um, so on that note, I also do want to ask you guys: Do you you have an Instagram? We do. That that um, you do a Friday at five where you guys yeah. chat with your your followers. Do you guys have any other avenues that you share your content or anything? 
Yes. Yeah, so we, we throw out of those a, uh, a podcast from our you know IGTV, so not everybody likes to, to see our faces or you know, um, and that kind of does a lot more than than our uh, IGTV. Yeah. So. so most people are listening to us on the podcast, which is on like Apple Podcasts or Spotify or yeah, across it all, across on Acast it all. And, yeah. and Google Podcasts and all that sort of stuff. And it's just the Mead podcast, and we just sit there. We started off during during lockdown. For that community sort of aspect, yeah. also because we were kind of missing being able to just sort of talk to people and have a reason to talk. And yeah, it's been know. really good, and we've had some great guests like meteries all around the world, and we're trying to mix it up with you know, some other bits of drinks uh, industry professionals as well on occasions, but mainly mead makers, uh, beekeepers, that kind of thing. Okay, so I'll make sure and plug those things too in the description if you're watching the video or on the podcast itself, but they'll be down there. Now, I have a few questions and then I'll let you guys get back. I know you said you still have work to do, so I don't want to hold hold your time. Well, that's why we're happy to chat for as long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you about um, commercial meadery business. You said people come to you all the time and ask, how do I do it? What do I do? What are some tips uh, you would give for somebody who's interested in starting a meadery? I know that it could be different being in London compared to the US or wherever uh, else in the world, but. We're particularly fortunate in the UK that the, the regulations and the paperwork to, uh, isn't that onerous here. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Um, it's obviously you need to do it, but it's not, it's like a week or two's work. It's not months, if that makes sense. So it's mm -hmm. relatively approachable from that point of view. Um, the other one is I think what I, I kind of, there's a lot of like, mistakes we've made over the years but fundamentally it comes down to some sort of business 101s about like what are you actually going to make and how are you going to sell it and how you know, what is your route to market so yeah, yeah. um the thing we found in the uk is that it's fine to be uh people might love your stuff but unless they can get hold of it through distribution you're never going to get any scale and you're never going to be able to get there it's a mm -hmm. little bit of a chicken and egg situation in that so you've got distribution no one's going to know you're there but then how do you get to the distribution without anyway so we kind of that's taken a little bit of time to get work through and that's just been a, a bit of a slog um but i think if you could nail the distribution that's that is kind of that is the sweet spot right so being the only meter in london who was your go-to for these questions because i'm sure there are days where you were like woke up and you're like how do i get to distribution <laughs> did you contact anybody was it googling like uh, what did you do? Cry a lot, Gary. <laughs> cry in the shower a lot, thinking my mead. No, uh, well, who do I ask? I over the years I've built up a really good network of industry people, i.e., other brewers, other winemakers, other soft drinks producers, and generally um, by helping out other people as well you build a good network and then you say mm -hmm. oh shit oh sorry oh i don't have any cans um where can i get some more cans this week you know there's a can support shortage for example or that's real that's real <laughs> or um i am sending some stuff to korea and i don't know how to do the paperwork for that who do i know mm. ship to korea or you know and that, and that works both ways right so you're happy to help other people and generally the community in London is quite it's a nice most people have made a conscious decision not to be working in corporates or finance so they're kind of <laughs> relatively like-minded people um, yeah so uh that's kind of that's how I've, I've approached that but there are often many problems that you have never solved before and you just need to solve Hello, podcast listeners and watchers. If you are enjoying this podcast, check out my Patreon. It is patreon.com slash manmade mead. For two bucks a month or more, if you want to support the channel more, you can gain exclusive access and early access to all of my videos. You can also support the channel, help me create new content, and rest easy know knowing that I am able to do more with this mead community. I hope that you enjoy this podcast and I hope you will come and support me on Patreon if you'd like even more mead content. And because I feel like I, I would do that, I mean, thankfully we have Google now and you can get on Reddit and somebody's had the issue or, you know, has been through what you're going through. But commercial meadery stuff I feel is different just because um, it's still growing. There's still lots of questions and we have to, um, dive in in different ways so the one one question i had because i'm curious um what were some of the challenges you you ran into 
but you weren't expecting with like a metery. Is there anything that you wish you'd been forewarned about prior to owning one? Oh, wish I'd been forewarned about. Um, I guess it is around. I mean, and this is my own fault. It's probably around how how important the brand and marketing side of the business is. Mm -hmm. Right. So how in, how integral that is to the product. You can't just get away on something that tastes amazing. That's if I'm being generous, 50% of the product, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is a, it is so integral to what, what you're doing. And we've spent a long time over the last three years getting our ship in order in order to get the branding right, get the story right, get the, the look and feel just so it looks professional. And also if someone picks it up and they understand from the visual yeah. cue what yeah, they're gonna get. That's, that's a really big thing, especially um, in this industry, right? Because it's so new and it's so challenging, you need to win that battle before someone's tasted it. Um, and so that is the thing that I, if I had my time again, I, that's what I would have done first. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out we're very good at making liquid, we're not blowing our own trumpet, but we are, we're awesome at making liquid. It's the, it's the marketing of it and packaging of it and you know making it desirable for consumers that we've really had to learn, I guess. And people, I mean, to that point, you're, you're right. If I walk through the liquor store and I see something, I'm, you're drawn to the label first and course, yeah. the, you know, the art on it, the neatness of it, whatever it might be. So you wanna make sure that you look good. Um, that's a big thing. I, I, you know, I, yeah. I went to the wine shop the other week and my girlfriend was like, did you just buy these because of the labels? And I was like, a hundred percent. Because they, they have pretty labels. Yeah. That's not a bad thing. It catches your eye. It also gives you a little bit of confidence. Sometimes, you know, like if the label's too nice and the price is too low, I get a little, okay, you probably spent too much money on the on the label and not off, uh, on the liquid. liquid but, but, uh, no. but you kind of, you know, that's what you go for. And if, if they put enough effort in to make their products, you know, stand out, then, you know, hopefully the liquid stands out too. It's worth taking that risk. Yeah. So this was, this is sort of similar to a question I put up there, but, um, Prior to creating your meadery, do you feel like you had three or four recipes that you were super confident in, or were you like, "I've got, I've got this one, and we're just gonna dive in"? Uh, I didn't say I didn't say that one. I just kind of went <laughs> for it. Uh, it was, I mean, I was mid twenties, so I was feeling a lot bolder than I was. As we said before, we we just finalised that that one recipe. Yeah, exactly. Which was after the first recipe. Yeah, exactly. From... Although we did find some of those original batches, not original batches, but like really early batches that I made on my own, and they were okay. They weren't great. They, they still held carbonation they... in you know after five years in a three wow. thousand bottle uh, yeah. with a crown cap, hand caps, yeah, hand caps, you know. Um, <laughs> They were, honey, they were honey, okay. Yeah. yeah, the honey character was huge. It was a little bit more oxidized, a little darker, and, and a little bit more sort of caramel quality compared to what we do now. But I was hugely surprised. Yeah, and I think I was as well. Um, and I think we've been kind of fortunate that we've developed that base recipe that I'd been working on for probably four years before I set up the meadery was a decent base, right? It was, I mean, mm -hmm. I said I had another recipe. I was still refining it, but there was the legs of something there. Um, and it was a different style to, and it was repeatable. I'd done enough batches at home that I knew that I was honing in on something. Yeah. Well, and I asked that because I feel like in my head, maybe it's the um, having a safety net. Like if I were to start one, there's nothing nothing against what you've done. Like I just would be terrified. Um, well, I was. I think there, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean. I cry, I cry in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. um, <laughs> Been a long day. It's been a long day. It's been a long, it's been Dude, a long day. I can't. I. I, I would. Uh, I don't want to dive. In. I'm curious, but I'm not going to ask you to tell me here. Like I know that. I, w I want to know what the life of a uh, um, of a metery operator is like. It'd be interesting to follow you for a day and just see. Uh, well, when, when it opens up, you'll have to come over and spend some time. Yeah, I would love to. I w I've actually never been to anywhere in Europe, and I mean, so I'm. I would love to. Um, I'm in Europe anymore, so it's no, fine. it's fine. Anyway, that's a story for another. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So the answer is it's quite varied and it's exciting. But I think um, you do at some point you do have to do it. If you're going to do, if you're going to set up your media, you do need to do it. Yeah, you'll never, you never be a hundred percent ready, and you're going to make mistakes. It's going to go wrong, and it's going to be really hard. And the good days are really good, and the bad days are really bad. I guess that that's kind of how it how it rolls. Yeah, well, that kind of plays into my other question, which was, uh, you know, what advice would you give somebody 
starting, and you, you've given some good advice already to just jump into it and make sure you you are uh, know some back knowledge, backdoor knowledge. Yeah, of what you're I, doing. I think I think you kind of need to. There's a you know either you need to know the products really well, or if you've got a marketing background, for example, you could just be that, mm. or you've got you got to know what you're you're good at and what you're not good at, I guess, and hire in or you know fill those gaps somehow mm -hmm. whether that's another team member or whether that's building your own knowledge you know and that that will obviously align with your ambition as well whether you just want to be a one-man person churning out some decent meat at a farmer's market once once a week or whether you want to be anheuser bush right like somewhere mm -hmm. in between well and uh you guys talked to ricky i i also got to um, chat with ricky on the podcast and it was a lot of fun and he mentioned that too you know he is the brewer creator of all the, their products essentially but his wife is the is the financial the business brains not that ricky's not but he's he said it himself is the one that's pulling the strings to get everything where it needs to be so having somebody and i'm speaking as somebody who has i do not own a meadery i feel like having somebody who uh can be on one side of the brain opposite of you is super helpful yeah and i think that's one of the things i would have done differently having so, so it's taken a long time to build the team to the point of where it is and we're fortunate to have to will here and hector and james and sam but if for a long time it was just me on my own and that's really hard going being a founding a business and having it all rest on you is mm -hmm. it's really stressful um and really hard so if you can find somebody else to to share that load with especially if your skills kind of tessellate um, that's that's an amazing partnership. Um, yeah. So I want to I want to finish with one last question, and feel free to share. You can say no, but I would love to hear your biggest one of your mead fails that you've had over the years throughout your commercial mead. Has there been a batch that's blown up? Has there been a tank burst? Has there been anything wild happen? They're, they're that's disastrous. Yeah, that, that, that's just that's just a cheese though. The, the um, amount of times I've, I've added the vistas to the to the FE and not left enough headspace and and come back the next day and I've got a roof covered in in foamy red goodness. Yeah, um, we used to be on the first floor actually, and I left the tap on, and uh, the, we had a floor like a no floor drain and just a floor that was that held water. Oh man, about four inches of water over the whole floor, and I had to hoover it up <laughs> with with the wet bath. That was awful. Uh, I think, um, of course, there's been experiments over where I, you know, I made sea buckthorn and white pepper mead. Ooh, once that was, that was a bad one. And that, 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 it just tasted like salami, which is, you know, good if you wanted to make salami mead, but when yeah, you're trying to make salami like mead. And, <laughs> and, and, and different, and, uh, you know, you, you make these fails all the time, but that's yeah. just, you know, if you don't try to make something fun and weird you, you, you never really yeah i think most of mine were were much earlier on and they were over pitching ingredients right so so putting stuff in the ferment and just putting way too much like ginger or mint or thyme or rosemary um and it just ends up just tasting exactly like just like that ingredient there's nothing else there uh -huh. because you know we we're, i mean i really well, we really like to ferment on top of the ingredients so that um you kind of get that marriage of it you know the flavors in primary it's in there for a long time and so the extraction just gets get deeper and deeper and deeper yeah the only one that we we do that where we actually pull it out is is the uh, gooseberry and assam tea that we used yeah. to do we still do it every now and again yeah. but um that there tea is one of those ones when you got something that's got a lot of tannin structure just like wood you, you taste it and mm -hmm. every batch is different but once you hit that profile you need to get that out yeah like over over tannin over tannin mead. Oh, it's not what you need. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> over oak no. wine. It's, it's just right, like, nobody it? likes it. There's nobody going like, I, I love a furry mouth wine. It's just it's, it's not where it's at. No. But then we've, we've done silly things like, you know, try to push the carbonation in our bottles to see, you know, they say they can take six bar, but can they? Can they? They can. Um, but then you can't pasteurize them. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. you make little mistakes like that. Be like, yeah. oh, yeah, how do I stop this now? Yeah, I mean, there's loads of mistakes around the past, uh, the carbonation, the pasteurization, which I, I made in the early days, but that was just technical. Yeah, you're dialing it in, right? And you're going to make those mistakes and you, you know you're going to make those yeah. mistakes. But it's yeah. ours also now with the knowledge, with the knowledge you've got now, you look back and you're like, what the hell was I doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like, that's so, that conclusion, that's like right? basic physics. <laughs> like, come on. Um, like, you can work this out. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, uh, I love getting to hear. I did a um, a 
Mead Fails YouTube series, and I still do some where I have people send them to me just because I think it's important that uh, while we are, we are acknowledging the great meads we make, we also acknowledge the bad meads and the failures so we can learn from one another. Like you said, you know, if you add too much time in and you, that's, you have a, a very heavily spiced mead, stuff like that where you're just, um, it, it seems common knowledge, but some people don't really think about it until they see someone else do it. So I don't think there's anything wrong with like, making a silly mistake because we all got to learn they, they come out and make really cool things like we we did a barrel barrel age traditional which at about 18 months of barrel aging i'd say something that's incredible and i'll like, pull that out next week and then uh we we just didn't we got wrapped up in in production and the barrel sat there we didn't have time and by the time i got back to it i was like you know what that's that's gone past that's over oats and it was up to that sort of decision we like do i dump this and i was like all right, let's see what happens when we leave it in there for another 12 months. Mm. And we got it up to two and a half years yeah. and that over oaked process started to turn around and, and really mellow out, which is something that, you know, even for me, I didn't ever no, experiment yeah. before, you know? Like once it was over oaked, that, that to me was enough, but to leave it just kept going and going and suddenly it just got to another stage where I was like, oh, that that's tasting great again, you know? And then I was like, cool, now we're bottling it. I'm not, yeah. I'm not taking that risk anymore. And that was one of our first proper dry traditionals that we did. Like, that was, it was just incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tom, Will, thank you so much for your time. Can you uh, share all the places we can find you and support you? I would love love to hear that. So we are on Instagram and TikTok at Gosnell's Mead. Yeah, indeed. And, and, and Facebook, Facebook and, and Facebook and, and YouTube. Twitter. It's <laughs> at Gosnell's Mead. And then if you want to listen to the podcast, it is the Mead Podcast. And you can get us in every total wine shop in the US. Yeah, I was I uh, was looking again today at the total wine shops, trying to find my closest one, and I was like, I gotta take a, a little road trip because I want to try your stuff, but I I gotta make it over there. I can only imagine. Do a, do a trip for you. Yeah, mead mead. <laughs> Meat feel like that. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time. If you want to support, if you want to support Gosnells, check out everything in the uh, description below to support them and um, go try their stuff. If you have a Total Wine and you're in the U.S., you can get it super easily. Um, and I, w I would love to uh, send everyone I can your way because you guys are awesome people. And I'm gonna try your mead one day when I can get to it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Sort it out. It's great to chat to you again. Yeah, yeah absolutely. This was I had fun last time, and this was this is awesome. I love getting to do this. Keep fighting the so, good fight. Absolutely. Thank you guys for your time again. Thanks very much. Take care. Take care. Cheers. Cheers.